Finland featuring Finland. Wow what? Mao and Geopold. Why are they so happy? Is it because they're white? Is it because Finlandia is the best vodka to grace the planet? Alan Wake 2? Every time I talk about Motherfuckers say Finlandia is the best vodka to grace the planet? That is an insane take. What the fuck? Finnish people are Turks, yes. Technically. Of Finland, I somehow summon all 7 million Finnish people to watch my video and comment Finland mentioned. Well, it's gonna be mentioned a lot because it is, in my opinion, a crazy ass country with a lot of quirks and features. Anytime I hear something is Finnish, I know it's about to be weird in the best way possible. I have a lot of Fair. things to say about this place who, according to some people, may or may not even exist and it might just be water. Finland is a welfare state, which means that if anything, the government got you. Now, that is fake shit. All real ones grew up knowing that their government would not do jack shit for them and even more take from them. So seeing a society where people trust their government to not do bullshit is absolutely insane to me. For me, growing up was 50 cent. Get rich or die trying. No post-Soviet person has ever had the thought that, yeah, if anything happens, my government will have my back. Yeah, they'll have your back up against the wall. For six years in a row, Finland has ranked number one as the happiest country in the world. Classic Georgian. Classic Georgian take. World, but I think this is cap. They've got one of the highest alcohol consumption rates in Europe and also one of the highest self ending rates in Europe. When you have one of the highest rates of self destruction in Europe, it doesn't seem like the happiest country in the world. I think that a lot of that statistic has to do with the fact that if some random person came up to you and asked you if you're happy, Finnish people are more likely to answer yes than other people. Because if you look on this map of 2020 happiness scale, Georgians say they're very sad and Finnish people say they're very happy. However, the self-destruction rate is not even close to that of Finland's. However, they do have a lot to be happy about. A major part of this is security. As I said, in post-Soviet countries, it's get rich or die trying. While in the Nordic countries, they have things that Americans could not dream of, such as one of the best education systems in the world for free. Yeah, it's like... Okay, this is able so you can commit happy suicide? <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, it's like these guys got the benefit of like being under the sphere of influence of the West while simultaneously tutoring along with the with the potential to, you know, be very close in proximity to the Soviet Union. So uh, America was like, or I guess like all capitalist forces were like, all right, I guess we'll capitulate. I guess we'll give in to some of these demands of socialization. I think that's, you know, one of the major factors here. Weird to imagine a world where, like, that was a real threat because none of us have lived in that world. At the very most, most of us are, were born into a world where there was no USSR or was on the verge of collapse, you know, or an illegal dissolution, if you will. So, therefore, we have no way of understanding it because we were born into the neoliberal era. At, like, some of the oldest people, like myself were directly born into the neoliberal era. So we did not get to experience a, a world where there was a very real fear that countries might actually start aligning with another power and another economic organization of society. So, you know, we're in the permaliberal, uh, the permaliberal monoculture but not long after, I was born before the collapse, but not long after, but it doesn't matter because at that point, it's like it was barely fucking hanging on by threads. We're talking like a lot of these amenities, these social democratic amenities that came, came not in at the end, at the tail end of the USSR, but, uh, you know, post-World War II free healthcare, cleanest air in the world, and a short work week. They have a lot to be happy about. Essentially, literally everything besides their weather. They do pay for all these benefits with their very high rates of tax, but to be honest, suck my dick. I would gladly pay high taxes if it meant that I received all these benefits and the money actually went to the country and developing the environment and the people around me instead of buying G-wagons for my Eastern European politicians. So their people feel very safe and 
secure. It's literally the same feeling as when you have money saved up. You know that if things go wrong, you can still be good and not die. Their safety feeling was ruined in the past. The Soviet Union wanted to conquer all of Finland and establish a communist Finnish government. Could, Could she, she really, really be, be here waiting, waiting for, for me? me? I'm still waiting for real communism. He is my neighbor. Nursuk tam tuliakbai. He is painting my assholes. So the Soviet Union invaded Finland on the 30th of November 1939. The whole conflict lasted a bit more than three months, which is why it was called the Winter War. It was also called the Winter War because it's extremely cold up in this region and they went to war when December was starting. Defeating the Soviet Union was a hard task. You have a schizophrenic Georgian in charge of literally endless people. And to say Finland was at a disadvantage would be an understatement. Finland had a population of 3.7 million people at the start of the war and the Soviet Union had 170.5 million people. They literally had like 30 tanks bro compared to the Soviet Union's 6,000. They were severely outnumbered, outgunned, out air Don't ask who we allied with against the Soviets. I mean, I mean there's only there's only one or two at that point right? I mean <laughs> there's only there's only one option at that point, it seems. Do, do not Google Finnish Air Force flag. Okay, guys, they took it out in like 2016. Okay, it, they took it out in 2016. Okay, you guys are being a little aggressive with this whole situation. Oh, no, not 20. Uh, oh, it was 2020. It was 2020. Oh my god, I thought it was 2016. It was 2020. Oh my god. That's crazy. Like nobody looked at that and went That That is that Is that What is that? No, I've covered it before, of course. I've I've talked about it a lot. People get really mad about this when you bring it up, by the way. Um some Finnish people get very defensive. Yeah, no, it's so funny because people will go, oh, this predates, uh, I, no, I wasn't a sweet, it was a Swedish guy, I thought, yeah, the, this actually predates the Nazis using the, the swastika, and it's like, brother, it, you got it from a Swedish guy who was a Nazi, like, what do you mean? <laughs> it doesn't matter. <laughs> like... Until 1945, his planes bore a blue uh, swastika on the white background. It was not intended to show allegiance to Nazi Germany, though the two nations were aligned. <laughs> While the symbol was left off the planes after World War II, a swastika still featured in some Air Force unit emblems, unit flags, and decorations, including on uniforms, a spokesperson for the Finnish Air Force told the BBC. <laughs> what is a swastika? <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, Prof Tavanen told the BBC that swastikas would be seen on Finland on buildings dated in the 1920s. In Finland, there's this idea that it's a random decorative sign, which to some extent it is. The famed Finnish artist Oksidi Galen Kalela first used a symbol in painting in, in 1889. The romantic painter went on to use the swastika as part of his design in the insignia of the Order of the Cross of Liberty. He used the cross. Oh my God. I didn't even know. What the hell? He used the cross with much smaller hooks, so the visual similarity of the Nazi symbolism was much less pronounced. That's still the official flag of the Finnish president? What the hell? Oh, yeah, here, this is the guy. A Swedish nobleman called Count Erik von Rosen. The Count used the swastika as a personal good luck charm when he gifted a plane to the nascent Air Force of Sweden's newly independent neighbor in 1918. He had uh, a blue swastika painted on it. This tool in type D was the first aircraft of the Finnish Air Force and subsequent planes all had this blue swastika symbol on it too until 1945 supporters of a continued use of the symbol point out that there was no there were no Nazis in 1918 so the Air Force's use of the swastika has nothing to do with Nazism except the thing is they did align with the Nazis <laughs> so it makes it kind of weird also, however, while Eric von Rosen had no Nazi associations at the time of his 1918 gift, he did subsequently became a leading figure in Sweden's own National Socialist Movement in the 1930s. 
So even the guy that brought the swastika to Finland was just a straight up Swedish Nazi. <laughs> Uh, he was also brother-in-law of senior German Nazi Hermann Goering, and according to Professor Tevon, Tevinen, a personal friend of Hitler. You don't understand. He had no Nazi affiliations when the Nazis didn't exist yet. He just happened to also then have Nazi affiliations when they did exist, including Adolf Hitler. <laughs> anyway, it's funny, but... Uh, irrelevant to the main point of contention. Let's continue. Out tanked, out fucked, out everything, bro. They had to go up against one of the biggest armies in the world in temperatures as low as minus 43 Celsius or minus 45 Fahrenheit. You'd think that the Finns got their ass kicked, right? There's a reason why Finland did not become a Soviet satellite state because they fucked their asses. Let me help you. Listen. It was like. Classic. Classic Georgian man. Like hydrogen bomb versus cuffing baby. But the cuffing baby won. Looking at the casualties seems like a meme. Especially when you consider that this was one of the most powerful armies in the world at that time. Then the question arises. How did the Finns destroy over 3000 Soviet tanks while practically having no tank force of their own and basically no anti-tank equipment? They figured out that if you jam logs and crowbars into the bogey wheels of the tank, it becomes immobile. Then their alcohol company started making the delicacy of Molotov cocktails and bundled them with matches. It's like the energy drink and vodka bundle, but Finnish edition. They got to the point where one typical Soviet attack lasted one hour and in that hour they would lose a thousand people and 27 tanks would be immobilized on ice. This was the winter war because it was extremely cold. Karelia is freezing and at the beginning of the war only Finnish soldiers in active service had proper winter equipment. The rest would literally just wear their normal normal winter clothing and put some sort of insignia on their uniforms. A very cool thing is also that the Finns used to dress in all white, almost as white as they actually are, in that snow, which made them virtually impossible to see. So they would literally ski across the snow for the war against the Soviets, which hmm. were dressed in khaki uniforms for most of the war. This forested, rural terrain with no roads was used by Finnish ski troops against the Soviets to a massive success. This war ended in the best possible way it could have. Finland lost only a very, very small part of its territory and they inflicted insane damage to the Soviets. Remember, this war was between a country of not even 4 million people going up against 170 million it's with definitely, vastly more equipment. There it's was definitely an L to, to lose to a bunch of dudes skiing, okay? I'm just saying. It's <laughs> Obviously, there was some other shit going on, but that's definitely... <laughs> Come on, dog. They're skiing. It's like the fucking... It's like the, the, the Karachi police force, you know what I mean? Come on, they're rollerblading. It can't be that hard. Throw a pebble or something. There's also this Finnish dude called the White Death, who's regarded to be the best sniper ever, who killed over 500 Soviets in this war. It was like, Finland must go. Who must go? <laughs> and the USSR dissolved. Point to the USSR on a map. This is a Finnish victory. Stalin, give me the thug shaker. Give me the thug shaker, Stalin. Josip Trakia Tamashe, Josip. Josip Trakia Tamashe, Tko. It's really funny that this is the angle still, but then we spent the rest of the USSR's existence on appeasement and working with them like the president who was good at it was the most liked president ever. Um... Yeah, no, he's he's a little bit. Listen, as far as I understand, this content creator is Georgian, so his perspective on this is a little bit. Um, you know. So after all this business and Russia's reputation for invading literally every neighbor they've ever had in Europe, the Ukraine war started and everyone started grouping together because getting invaded by a schizophrenic alcoholic disturbs your peace and nobody wants it. Finland had this woman, Sanna Marin, who served as Finland's prime minister from 2019 Good. to 2023. And she literally got Finland into NATO. Lego Batman gear. All this talk about NATO expansion just to expand NATO even more and group everyone more against you. Insane amounts of Vladimir Putin L's, by the way. This is what I, this is unironically correct, 100%. Um, he is right about this. Just a incredible 
absolutely phenomenal W for NATO, a phenomenal W for all the generals. It's like, it's like the greatest, it's like the greatest thing you could have done for America. It was like such a gift. You because of your imperialism. Russia literally gave all of Europe a common enemy. NATO would literally not exist if Russia was not known for trying to annex its neighbors. So I congratulate Finland. I don't agree with that, but Finland on getting in because now they're guaranteed to not get invaded by Russia. Getting into NATO as a country bordering Russia is like being a frog in a lake, right? You're just chilling, just eating your bugs, and then this schizophrenic fucking idiot always wants to kill you. You're just a frog trying to have your Finlandia in peace, and then the Rukuis comes and gets your back. The schizo doesn't want to deal with Roquis, so he stops trying to kill you. You guys get what I mean? Essentially, joining NATO is literally the only way a country has a guarantee. America doesn't really get anything from NATO, though it's a giant money pit. Brother, the the notion that America doesn't get anything from NATO is the funniest thing I've ever heard in my entire life. Or the or well, almost as funny as NATO is peaceful. And uh both of those things are just completely fucking unimaginably false. America's empire is NATO. Without I mean, NATO is like the the you know, basic official uh, uh, consolidation of American empire. It is, in the most reductive terms, a protection racket that the mafia holds, but it's the best. You said it was a money pit, and you're not wrong. But where is that money being cycled in and out of is something that you should also consider. What is America's number one industry? What is the most important industry in the United States of America? Where does the money go, Chatter? It is a money pit. Where does it go? Gaddafi would have formed the United States of Africa if Hillary Clinton did not wield... Okay, dude. Gaddafi truthers are so fun. Yeah, dude, totally. No, definitely. That's why. They were like, Gaddafi, your weed's too strong. Your bitch is too bad, Gaddafi. Gaddafi... Stop trying to form United Nations of Africa, Gaddafi. They'll kill you. And then they killed him. Your hoe's too bad. Your hoe's too bad, Gaddafi. <laughs> Your monetary policy too risky. <laughs> They'll kill you, Gaddafi. And then it happened. Anyway. Um, yeah, no, I, uh, I mean, Gaddafi is an interesting figure. Yeah, his swag was too different and they killed him. See that they'll stay safe from a Russian invasion because they've invaded every one of their fucking neighbors in Europe. And people complain about NATO expansion. Bro, we don't care about these motherfuckers. We just don't want to go to war. They're over here trying to jack me off with sandpaper and NATO offers me a latex glove. Like, which one do you think I'm choosing? Like, us Georgians went through three wars with Russia before talking about, okay, maybe we should try joining into NATO since they keep going to wars with us. And then we went to another war with them. I want to get a hand job with a latex glove not sandpaper how hard is this to understand when i said anytime i it's a fair it's a fair take here's something is finished i know it's about to be weird in the best way possible this is what i mean alan wake 2 is a video game mixed with movie type of sequences starring real life actors the creators remedy entertainment why does they why does he think their governments just want peace oh you were joking nato never did any wars why does he think their government wants peace no no i mean if i'm a if I'm a Baltic state, it certainly makes infinitely more sense. Um, especially if I close my eyes and think of it as like not a buffer state for the more important European states that are actually like the really important NATO allies. You know what I mean? If I close my eyes for a brief moment and I'm Polish, I can imagine like NATO is actually there for me and not simply protecting me on... Uh, the boundaries of me being basically landmass between a more important state like Germany. You know what I mean? Like, if I close my eyes, it feels like I'm actually important in the process and not simply like, uh, like an area to resupply forward operating bases. The reason why I have a lot of smoke for uh, Poland recently is the Visegrad tweet, because like, his tweet about uh, the, the highway of death really fucking brought something in me, like a deep, deep anger and resentment inside of me, inside of my soul. 
just the notion of like masturbating to American imperialism as though you're part of the team, dog. Yeah, no, definitely. Look at us. We got <laughs> look at us. We got it, dude. We got it. We're we're so your Ottoman epigenetic memories activated. Well, that too. Okay. I don't discount that anger, but you've been shitting on Poland for days now. Okay, well, we're not all like Visegrad 24, bro. No, I know. I know. I know Polish chatter. Sorry, let's continue. But yeah, as far as NATO goes, uh, I'm no fan, obviously, for real historic reasons that I perceive to be very good reasons. Um... It is uh, the very same things that we've talked about with respect to, um, what were we talking about earlier? Like liberals doing war crimes and then saying that it was actually very good. That's just like the NATO position overall. However, having said that, Vladimir Putin's actions in Ukraine were so perfect for NATO expansion. Why? Well, because he simultaneously showed that the Russian ground forces are both belligerent enough to, you know, invade Ukraine, a nation state of 44 million people, but also not so strong that they can immediately implement air superiority and full control over it. They were never going to be able to like fully annex Ukraine regardless. Not going to happen. That would have been a counterinsurgency. There would have been a permanent counterinsurgency. It would destroy what remains of Russia. However, they definitely, they definitely did it in a way that was so like haphazard and so bad that it also gave confidence to other surrounding uh, formerly neutral nations to Russia, the confidence to join NATO without ever even thinking about it. Because what the fuck's he going to do? He's too busy with Ukraine, and he can't even do shit there. What is he going to do? Is he going to come to Finland? Okay, sure. Yeah. I'll single-handedly bring NATO down. NATO, if chat doesn't calm down, do it, Bluebird Daily. Yeah. Air superiority hasn't caught up with AA defense mechanisms. Only third world countries. You can Can you establish air superiority? Yeah, I mean, that's like an NBA team dunking on a kindergarten uh, at that point. And yet, by the way, air superiority is not the end-all be-all as we've seen. So sometimes the kindergartners, if they just like stay long enough and grow old, end up kicking the NBA team out of the courts. So that's kind of what they need to do usually. That's literally what is happening over and over again, nonstop. Reason why I knew this game was from Europe was they showed a naked dude and his dick was uncut. All these American developers showed their <laughs> dicks cut. What's up with this? I looked it up and Remedy Entertainment was Finnish. You get to find out a lot more about it in the game because there are some characters with the heaviest Finnish accents they could get. I swear they had a casting for the heaviest accents in Finland. Hey, I, I can't seem to find my way this out of here. This guy's awesome. Can you point me to the exit? <laughs> Of course, Tom. The work will instruct its maker. I was gonna get something from the basement for you, but you can get it yourself now. I understand NATO sucks, but does it need to reform or should something replace it? I mean, I'm a bit of a truther, uh, like Yanis Varoufakis, that the European Union could be reformed inevitably to like uh, not churn out neoliberal capitalism, but instead, I guess, uh, some semblance of socialism. But no, NATO is not a thing that it's like reforming the police. Like, no, you can't. That's not happening. That doesn't mean that like there there isn't a necessity. Well, NATO is a little bit different than the police as well, because there's a need for, you know, some semblance of law and order. NATO, on the other hand, nah, <laughs> no, it is one use and one use only. You can't reform it. Like, it, guys, guys, guys. Just don't Google, you know. Western German involvement in NATO, if you want to understand what I have to say, or Google, I don't know, Operation Gladio or something. I am not a police abolitionist, no. But, yeah, reforming NATO is like reforming the Third Reich, which is a good take, actually, because, lo and behold, a lot of the Third Reich guys 
may have made their way into NATO. Just saying. NATO, Nazi arming and training organization. Yeah, I guess what we did with NATO was we reformed the Nazis and turned them into, like, Nazi Plus. The more cooks, the worse the soup. <laughs> but the funniest thing to me was the fact that the main characters are supposed to be American, but their actors are, are Finnish, right? And because they had such heavy accents, the actor is a Finnish dude, but he's... I wonder if our Georgian friend knows about that, probably. I'm sure. Voice acted by an American dude to fit I think the that's why he didn't, like, suck NATO's dick as hard and literally said it's like the difference between getting a hand job with a... It's the difference between getting a hand job with a latex glove and getting a hand job with sandpaper. That's why he said that. Also, I think that if the main character was constantly speaking with a heavy Finnish accent, it would make the game a lot more enjoyable because... Guys, listen, listen. Post World War II, come on, stop supplying that the Nazis ruled the world. Really, the supplying narrative that the Nazis ruled the world, brother. I'm a firm believer that, and I just talked about it uh, uh, earlier as well. That that neoliberalism just simply gave more breathing room for a more reformed fascist administration, a fascist organization. Um, fascism will inevitably come once again in order to organize the the uh, crises that we experience under capitalism. Um, but also, yeah, it's just what is the take? What's the famous? What's the famous statement? It's like um, Nazis lost World War II, but they they won. Like they, but Nazism won. Like fascism won. I mean, come on, think about it. Think about it, okay? Nazis might have lost World War II, but fascism won is definitely a prescient take when you consider the fact that there was a fucking SS Galicia division Ukrainian Nazi that got a standing fucking ovation in the Canadian parliament like literally three months ago or four months ago, okay? Why did he get that standing ovation? Not because everyone's like secretly a Nazi or whatever, okay, in, in the Canadian parliament. It's more nefarious than that. It's more banal, but more nefarious than that at the same time. That was a misunderstanding, though. No, the misunderstanding only stems from the reality that those Nazis happen to be anti-communist. You cannot chalk that up as a misunderstanding if it's a deliberate attempt to pump your numbers with a bunch of anti-communist and anti-socialists. Who are the biggest anti-communist and anti-socialist post-World War II? Who were the best anti-Nazi and anti-socialist fighters after World War II? Because guess what? Countries had partisans. Countries had resistance members. All of those guys were labor union people, trade unionists, uh, socialists, communists, and anarchists as well. Those guys fought against the Nazis and the fascists. The, the fascists that lost, however, were put back into power after World War II by, you might have guessed it, countries that involved themselves with NATO, whether they wanted to or not. So that's it. That's the whole point, is that because those guys were the best communist killers out there, America was like, well, the real war is against communism. Let's go. Let's use the best communist socialist killers let's use them to our advantage they're just standing there not doing anything because cool accent they also delve a lot into finnish and scandinavian culture including an extremely weird but cool whole ass musical in the game which became a fan favorite and then they performed it live. okay but the uk is in nato and are the most anti-nazi of them all country of them all i'm sorry what All right, I can't even finish this video. I'm, I gotta go. I have dinner. Uh, I have a boys' night. But that was funny, Chatter. Thank you. That was sick. That was a good. That was a good haha -ha meme to to end it on a, a funny note. Yeah. 
bro i'm not even kidding like given how much i feel like hitler was such a weeb for uh the british royals like i i feel like i feel like there was a very real like non-appeasement but a direct alignment that could have happened he just said italy was anti-nazi no he didn't he's joking I mean, when you think about the Tory party, when you think about the Tory party, the conservatives, um, they put a statue up of like, what was it, Margaret Sanger recently? What did, what did she say? She said something along the lines of like, Hitler had it right about the Jews, things of that nature. She expressed her views. Okay. According to Edward Renahan Jr. in the 1930s, a store wrote to the U.S. Ambassador Joseph P. Kennedy showing she was able to overcome her anti-Catholic bigotry in a few individual cases about her opposition to launching a war against Nazi Germany. She expressed her view that Hitler would have to do more than give a rough time to the killers of Christ, adding, who are we to stand in the way of the future? Indeed, she felt Hitler could be a solution to what she regarded as the world problems of Jewish people and communists. Kennedy concurred, though cited fears that this approach would be opposed by the Jew media in America. <laughs> That's why I always like to joke and say that, like, if things were, like, 3 to 4% different, both England and the United States of America could have very likely ended up on the side of the Nazis in World War II. You know, but we there was a Chad uh, in charge who did a lot of stuff that wasn't Chad-like to the Japanese, for example. But you know, did some did some cool things. Other than that, some good ideas and some very bad ones. That's all I'm saying. 